Okay, um, when I said yes to this uh, speaking invitation, I, I was kind of sloppy, uh, so I didn't really check out what it was. And I imagined a group sort of of 30 people, sort of kind of low-key, relaxed, and then it's this craziness. <laughs> so if I'm nervous, if you think I'm nervous, it's because I am nervous, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, background, as it was mentioned, psychologist. Um, did that for 10 years, got tired of that, um, and moved on to doing organizational work, more focused on how organizations can create a culture, an atmosphere that promotes creativity and innovation. Um, and in that research, in the consultant work, um, you know, there's all these flow charts and models of innovation and, um, and, and organizational creativity, um, but at the end of the day, um, all the methods in the world aren't going to help if people are still afraid of making mistakes. Because without these mistakes, without these failures, uh, we can't get any uh, progress. So <clears throat> I got kind of obsessed with this, about, this stuff about failure because I'm so sick and tired of these success stories. It's like they're being forced down your throat constantly by media, by articles, especially, I mean, I know I've got sort of a, a narrow perspective within innovation, but I mean, it sounds really strange that within innovation, 80, 90% of all innovation projects, they fail, right? But we never hear about them. All we hear about are these fantastic success stories of, oh, we, we started Spotify, now I'm a billionaire. There's never anything like, <laughs> there's never anything like, hey, we wasted 200,000 euros and we are broke and nothing happened and now we're, going back to work at Pizza Hut. No, we don't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pizza Hut. <laughs> so um, all these success stories, they sort of follow the same narrative, um, and I wanted to change that. So I opened a museum of failure. Um, so this is, uh, this is the museum in Helsingborg. Um, ironically, we closed last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> the hashtag meta failure. <laughs> um, we, we had no idea that this museum would be such a huge success, so we, we only booked the venue for the summer, and it was crazy, um, and now we, we won't be able to move into our new space until April in Helsingborg, Sweden. So the museum has about 70 different failed innovations, Come on. Um, everything, I've really tried to sort of not only have tech products, but to have all kinds of different uh, failed products and services. So food, there's business model failure, there's, of course, about a bunch of tech failure, uh, digital sort of transformation failure, anything I could find that was failure. Uh, I try to keep away of political failure, but I mean, Trump has to be in a museum of failures. So of course he's there. <laughs> um, and like I was saying, the, the stories of success are always the same, but um, Leo Tolstoy, um, he, quote, he, he wrote, uh, all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in their own specific way, right? So I like to steal quotes and tweak them and then take full credit for them. So here you go, here's mine. <laughs> this is, so I mean, um, as I was saying, success sort of follows sort of similar sort of narratives, but failure, you, you can fuck up anywhere in the innovation process, anywhere, and it'll fail. Um, it makes for fascinating stories of how things went wrong. Um, and the museum's sort of purpose is to say, hey, let's not sweep these failures under the carpet. Let's, let's put them up on a literal pedestal and shine a spotlight on these failures so that we can discuss them and we can ultimately learn from them. Um, so the, 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 the main message of the museum is that we need to accept failure if we want progress, specifically then for innovation. Um, and another sort of message of the museum is that, is that organizations, even the coolest, most badass organizations, you guys, um, actually suck when it comes to learning from your failures. There are very few exceptions to that. Sorry. To, Go down on a negative note there, we'll go back up here. <laughs> 
So um, <clears throat> this segue, 2001, uh, people that visit me and say, but whoa, the Segway isn't a failure. I saw one outside, I saw one in Copenhagen, I saw one in Amsterdam. People, you know, tourists go and ride them before they get drunk, or <laughs> company events, they ride them before they get drunk. Um, well, true, the Segway still exists, but it's perfect. It perfectly illustrates uh, the definition of failure, and that is that it's a deviation from expected uh, outcomes, results. Uh, expected or desired outcomes. Um, <clears throat> so, so what was the story of the Segway? Two thousand. How many people have ridden a Segway? Okay, okay. I had a group uh, last week, and n nobody raised their hand. I was like, okay, I'm in the wrong audience here. <laughs> uh, it's really cool. It's a really cool device. Uh, when it came out, two thousand one, it was revolutionary. Uh, it was really expensive. Uh, it was a eccentric inv uh, inventor. Um, and it was cool. Um, people at the Silicon Valley, you know, big shots, they threw money at the Segway. So Steve Jobs, Jeff Benzo, all these guys. Um, <clears throat> and this is where things started to go wrong. So the expectations were enormous. So I'll just throw out some examples here. Uh, the Segway will be the first product in history to reach one billion US in sales within a year. Didn't happen. Okay, not even close. Uh, next one. The segue will be to the car what the car was to the horse and buggy. Are we getting started here? All right, one more. This is my favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, in the future, this is 2001, not 1800 one. So, um, it said, in the future, city infrastructure will be built around the Segway. <laughs> Okay, this is, these were real sort of expectations for the device. It's, it was expensive, it was relatively unsafe, unpractical, and you look stupid when you ride it. Um, <laughs> but, um, so it illustrates very well what we mean by, by, by failure. It does, things don't really turn out the way we expected. This, this actual one right here was bought, uh, it's expensive, even if it doesn't work. Uh, it was bought, there was a Saudi prince who drove off a pier into salt water. <laughs> Still cost me a thousand dollars, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's let's go back in history. Um, I applied for funding for the museum from the Swedish Innovation Authority, and in their reply, it's like, okay, you get the money, um, but we want to point out that your application text is wrong. You said that the Museum of Failure would be the first museum of failure uh, in the world. We would argue that the Vasa Museum in Stockholm. <laughs> is the first museum of failure. <laughs> so let me tell you shortly what happened there with the Vasa ship in the 1600s. Sweden was a huge, it's hard to imagine today, but Sweden was a, 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 like a, a, an empire at the time. Um, yeah, before Ikea. <laughs> um, and so the, the king was like, hey, let's, do a, let's make this awesome military vessel, the most heavily armed uh, vessel at the time. And you can't see the innovation because the boat's sinking, but there was two floors or two decks of cannons instead of just one. All right, so what happened? Well, a ship that's so top-heavy is going to be unstable, right? Well, the engineers knew this, so they'd done stability testing. They knew that the ship was unstable. Um, but the CEO, the king, <laughs> uh, he's like, we're launching, like, we got a war in Poland, we got to get that boat out there. The engineer's like, no, 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 it's unstable. Like, we're doing this anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then the, the marketing director, the, <laughs> the admiral, <laughs> he's like, we're freaking, we're going to launch this boat, we don't care. Put some extra rocks in there for ballast, it'll be stable. We've got We've got a party planned, there's food trucks ordered. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get this thing going, right? Um, fine, they launched the boat, there was a big party, and the ship made it sort of, I think it was one kilometer out into the harbor, and there's a little wind, and it just sank. <laughs> so, fascinating. This is almost 400 years ago. So, what's the lesson here? Don't launch shit before it works, okay? It's quite easy. Um, we don't learn anything from our history. We don't learn from our failures. This is Apple's screw up here. Um, anybody here have had a, a Newton? Okay. 
this is a cool crowd, okay. <laughs> a magnet of failures. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, so the Newton uh, launched in 93. It was really awesome. It was, um, it was, I mean, today Apple says, oh, this is a revolution, we're so cool. They're not anymore. But then this was actually really, really cool. So it, it didn't have a keyboard, so you, you wrote with a stylus and you could write with your like, handwriting recognition instead of a keyboard. This was really, really cool. It was a sexy device, well-designed, everything. Uh, Apple had put a lot of money into it. And um, same thing as the Vossa ship, uh, handwriting recognition didn't really work, right? But the competitors were going to launch similar products. We've got to get it out. We've already spent so much money on it. We will just update the software later. OK. So they launched it. The software wasn't updated quickly enough. And the Newton totally flopped. I mean, it was, it was so bad that the Simpsons made fun of it. And there were different sort of comedians who went to town on it. And ultimately, the Apple Newton, the, the word Newton itself, became synonymous with technology that doesn't work. That's not something you want to, your product associated with. All right. This is a plastic bicycle from Sweden from 1982. It was supposed to revolutionize the Swedish bicycle industry. It's made out of, it says in the brochure, it's made out of the same uh, materials as satellites, uh, spaceships, and jumbo jets. That's plastic, by the way. Um, it was cool. I think it looks cool. Some designer people think it's ugly. I think it's cool. Um, the problem with it, it was supposed to be half the price. It turned out to be double the price as a regular bike. Uh, but the biggest problem with this bicycle, it doesn't rust. That's a great thing. But the handlebars break. Um, <laughs> uh, but most importantly, the bike uh, wobbles when you bike. <laughs> so somebody described it as, it looks like a crocodile, but moves like an anaconda. <laughs> it was a failure. How many engaged people out here? A few, OK. Um, quickly, uh, Back in the year 99, 2000, uh, people had a Game Boy in one pocket and a phone in the other pocket. Nokia was at the top of the game. They combined the two. Set, with great idea, nothing wrong with the idea. They screwed up on the design, though, um, because, to, now I don't have my phone with me, but to use it as a phone, you had, look at the shape of it. You didn't hold it like this. You held it on the side like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and look at the shape. People called it mockingly the taco phone. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. It's, I mean, it worked. I mean, it's nothing, nothing. But that was just one of the design problems. The other, it's a gaming device. But to change a game in this device, you had to take it all apart. Take out the battery, take everything apart, change the, on a gaming device. Uh, and the implementation was also screwed up because they actually didn't work uh, uh, collaborate enough with third-party developers, so there was only two good games on it. You, you don't sell a gaming device with two games. Okay, we got a bash on Google as well. Uh, this is not long ago. I'm not going to ask who bought the Google Glass, because you got screwed. <laughs> uh, $1,500 for Google Glass. Um, what Google messed up on here was that they launched it as a ready Develop a, a develop, fully developed product. So it was, it came in a nice heavy box. It was expensive. You were you, you were carefully selected to be a Google Glass ambassador or explorer, as it was called. And <clears throat> and Google failed to appreciate the privacy concerns. So not only was it buggy as a prototype, and there was no real applications for it. Um, the the cafes around San Francisco had signs. No, you know. Um, no dogs allowed, and no, as the people were called, that had Google Glass. There's, an imp there's a built-in camera and microphone and connected to Wi-Fi. Um, no dogs, and then the other sign said, no glass holes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people with Google Glass were called. Um, this is kind of weird coming from Google. Like, come on, guys. You sh if anybody knows about privacy issues, it should be Google. Then, you know, why didn't they think that through? Uh, Google, Google, Coca-Cola, bl uh, black, 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 black. <laughs> so, 
So 2006, Coca-Cola says, hey, people are buying expensive premium coffees, that's a trend. Um, people are buying energy drinks, that's a trend. So let's make a drink geared, aimed at the ultra-sophisticated 30-year-old. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Um, <laughs> so, so they took coffee and mixed it with Diet Coke. That's Coca-Cola Black. Um, the only, the, t the product totally flopped. Um, it, uh, the only sort of sources I've found are that uh, Coca-Cola says, perhaps the taste was not for everyone. That's all I found. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it, we opened a bottle, I had three bottles, it's actually pretty bad. <laughs> Quickly here, um, Swedish uh, toothpaste from the 60s. Uh, those, because there's not many Swedes here, uh, Bofors is Sweden's largest weapons manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> So when rumors were started that the toothpaste had some kind of dangerous chemicals, nobody believed the weapons manufacturer when they said, no, no, it's safe, it's safe. You know? <laughs> All right, this one has gotten... <laughs> this is the one that's gotten... This is the only company that's threatened to sue me. Um, so from the sources of brand failures, this example is everywhere. So of course it's in, our, in, in the museum. My in, this is the only product that we've reconstructed the, the, the product, in this case the packaging. So it's not the original. Um, it's spelt the Swedish way of writing lasagna. So it's, it's a reconstruction. So after the piece, the article in the New York Times, I got a phone call from a New York number. I thought it was another journalist. I'm like, yeah, hello. And I was like, <coughs> Uh, I represent Colgate. <laughs> anyway, so we didn't really have a good conversation more, more than uh, I said, well, if I'm wrong, if this is an urban legend, if this never existed, if all the sources, the books are wrong, then send me the original and I'll just replace it. Or, you know, send me, the, send me an argumentation, send me some evidence that shows that this is wrong. And it's been four months now, and I haven't heard anything. So, somebody told me that they're probably planning their lawsuit now. <laughs> okay, so um, this one here I put in especially for you guys because I don't know how to say Reeperbahn is Reeperbahn. So um, red light district. So I thought this would be appropriate. Um, this is the world's first gender-neutral sex toy. <laughs> so on the box it says, "It's for her. It's for him." It's for him and her, it's for her and her, and it's for him and him. <laughs> and, and you can bend, and then on the box there's all kinds of instructions of how you can bend it, sort of, to, to, make, it, to, 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 to make it the way you want it. Um, <laughs> uh, great idea, so definitely nothing wrong with the idea. It was right, the, the, and you're not going to believe me when I say I, I didn't know about this before I did the research, but there's an entire industry of sex toy reviewers, like tech bloggers, but sex, sex toy bloggers. Um, everybody was excited about this because it was gender neutral, it sort of fit into the whole sort of, um, um, you know, there was high expectations for it. But then somebody wrote, that basically, it, the, the Transformer was uh, aimed, at, uh, aimed at satisfying everyone, but it ultimately satisfied nobody. <laughs> Bad sex toy. Quickly here, Twitter peak. Um, yeah, I don't know where to start on Twitter. It's, it's one of the stupidest products I have at the museum. 2009, uh, so it's not a long time ago. 2009, we already had smartphones. If you were a heavy user of Twitter, right, then you definitely had a smartphone and you had the Twitter app, right? So what does this company in San Francisco, uh, Peak is the name of the company, they launched a single-use device that only tweets. Okay, so, what? <laughs> it doesn't even tweet well. To, to, you can't even read an entire tweet on the screen. You have to scroll on a slow screen to read a whole tweet. You can't see, you can't follow links, you can't see audio, there's nothing, you can only read the text. Um, and you had to pay a monthly subscription for it. Um, it was somebody, it was a tech reviewer who summed it up quite nicely. He wrote, um, the, the Twitter peak is so dumb that it makes my brain hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one here is really good. <laughs> uh, any French people in here? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, this one's for you. Um, all right. Um, so, um, yeah. So women can't use regular pens. Uh, <laughs> so they are designed for us men. We're we're we know how to use pens. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what do you do if you're the biggest pen uh, manufacturer on earth? You, you design a pen specifically for women. Now, notice the, the details, it's, uh, it's kind of colors the women like. Um, there's even glitter on them. Um, and because women make twice the salary of men, they cost twice as much as a regular <laughs> pen as well. <laughs> Fantastic uh, innovation here by Bic. Um, just a little side note, um, I don't have sources, so this is just pure speculation on my part, but you know, there's a talk about diversity for innovation. I want to know if there's any women on the innovation team at BIC, anybody who would voice dissent and say, hey guys, some ideas are better left on the post-it notes in the brainstorming room. Anyway, this one's also good. I did a talk for IKEA, uh, was it two weeks ago? And I thought, oh, I, have to, I don't have this product at the museum, but I thought I have to piss, it was like the leadership group of IKEA. Um, um, there was 250 IKEA people in a room, and I thought I have to find a way to piss them off. Uh, so I found this. This is the IKEA Air, so it's inflatable furniture, right? First in the 80s, and then they tried it again in the 90s. So there's some advantages to this furniture. You can, <laughs> you can easily sort of lift it up and <laughs> vacuum underneath. So there's, however, this is hilarious. So, so there's, there are a couple of flaws here. Um, design people probably know about this. But um, so one flaw is so you inflate the furniture with hot air, like, or with a pump that sort of heats the air. And then your couch looks great. And then after a couple of hours, the air cools down in your couch, so the couch just sort of shrinks, right? So it doesn't look as good as it did, but that wasn't the main problem. The main problem is absolutely hilarious. So, so um, if, you, if you've got two windows open in your apartment, <laughs> so then your furniture just moves around in your living room, you know? <laughs> Absolutely hilarious, absolutely hilarious. <laughs> I got, I, I'm gonna get this couch. So if you, if you come in April to Helsingborg, I, I swear to God, I'm gonna have that couch. <laughs> so this one's also good. Um, so this is, um, <laughs> yeah, this gets better than that. Um, so. This is Olestra. Olestra is a 1996 uh, Procter & Gamble, the like, mega, mega corporation for consumer products and, and, and foods. Um, they're like, let's design a calorie-free uh, fat substitute, all right? So, and the big, the big uh, uh, potato chips uh, companies, Frito-Lay and, 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 and Pringles, like, oh, this is perfect. We can, uh, you know, it's like the holy grail of food, food science. There was just a certain, you can, you can probably tell what the side effects were. <laughs> on the can, on the, so the, the chips became known, and there were some warning labels that the, it caused, so, no, this is good. So, uh, no, there's no calories in it, blah, blah, blah. But it, it may cause, listen carefully here now, anal leakage. <laughs> 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 I think it's beautiful. Um, appa so apparently, and I, I, again, I'm not absolutely certain if this is true, but apparently, the, 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 when they in the product development, the recommended serving the recommended serving size for potato chips is like five or six potato chips. Nobody eats that, uh, and especially not if they're fat, or calorie free. Then you eat the whole damn can, <laughs> and and then you get the explosive diarrhea. So. Good stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> see. Her. So there's some business models as well that failed. So just quickly, I won't do the whole story with Kodak. It's kind of a sad story. This mega awesome company with all the technical know-how. I mean, they were they were 
They were real, really kick-ass. Had all the money, could see the future. They developed a digital camera in the 70s, and management had told the engineer when they saw the prototype, that's cute, let's not tell anybody about it. All right, fast forward, they caught up, um, and Kodak was a pioneer in, uh, in digital cameras. They even created an early version of Instagram called Ophoto in 2001. That's a long time ago. Um, and uh, so they made the cameras for Apple and a bunch of other companies. They were, they were very successful with that. Their problem was, as technology was changing, they didn't change their business model. They, they tried to make money. They, their only source of income or primary source of income was uh, printing or, or developing photos. Now, you know where this is going. Um, it didn't take long, 2012, despite having all the success making digital cameras, um, nobody prints their photos anymore. So they went bankrupt. And the irony of this is that the same week that Kodak went bankrupt, Instagram was sold to Facebook for one billion US dollars. It's a sad story, if that, uh, it's a cautionary tale that we have to, I mean, innovation is not only about take, I mean, for, as in Kodak's case, it's not only about technology, uh, it's not only about um, developing new products and services, it's about being willing to question your own uh, business model, which is very difficult. I'm just going to leave this one. Um, I don't have time to describe it. Basically, pay attention to your mistakes. If the, if the German scientists in the 20s had paid attention to their mistakes, Germans would have discovered nylon. Instead, 10 years later, a, a chemist in the United States paid attention to his mistakes during his, his experiments uh, and discovered nylon. Um, I just want to end here with some sort of um, last minute thoughts on uh, failure. Um, we all talk about it, you've all heard about fail forward and oh, failure is the empty space between success. You, you've all heard these cliches and these quotes, um, but it's very, very uncommon to actually see um, companies, organizations in general, uh, uh, live, live the talk, you know, walk the talk. Um, most organizations, regardless of how cool they are uh, and, and how innovative they claim that they are, um, there's still uh, uh, this, this sense, this climate within the, the team and the organization. We we're afraid of it and we penalize it. So the, the solution to this problem is called psychological safety. And I see I only have one more minute left here, but I encourage you to <laughs> Google it. <laughs> um, psychological safety is the key to learning from, to creating a culture where the team and the, ultimately the organization can learn from failure. It's a, say, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a perception within the team that I can um, ask questions that I probably should know the answer to. I can, I can ask my team members for help. Um, I, can, uh, I can be vulnerable and I can, most importantly, I can, um, I can sort of be open to my own fallibility, that I'm not perfect and I need everybody's help to make this happen. Um, psychological, there's a lot of research done on it. It comes originally from healthcare teams. But um, to, to, to establish a culture within the team and, and within the organization where you can learn from um, your own and other uh, innovation failures, it does require to be, to be, be willing to deal with it. Um, failures are uncomfortable. Um, uh, they were embarrassed. We, 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 would, we would prefer to discuss something else. Uh, we would prefer to, oh, we're working on a new project over here, come and look, rather than discuss and sort of deal with um, the failures. But I, 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 truly, I truly believe, I'm absolutely convinced that there's so much that we can learn from our own failures and from the failures of others, that I think it's a shame that we let that sort of emotional discomfort and sort of risk of embarrassment uh, um, limit that. But um yeah. Right on time, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Samuel West.